Everything for me started in, uh, in Hawaii. I guess I was about 14 years old when I first started shooting. And uh, I love photography and everything about it in those days. And a friend of mine had a contact at, at a local radio station who also was a concert promoter. So he made a deal with them oh, saying, man, that's cool. we trade pictures, you give us tickets and backstage passes. That's a fair trade. That was a wonderful trade. <laughs> and, you know, the rest is history. We shot every show that came into town for years, for years. So the first show that that worked out for me to shoot was Blind Faith. This is like 1969. And in those days, stages were maybe three or four feet off the ground. So when you got up to the stage, you had to sort of crouch down. And so every once in a while, you could pop your head up and, and shoot right at stage level. And the reason I put these up here is because in those days, the lighting was so bad in concerts. Because they were, they were going from having hockey games and wrestling matches to having entertainment in these big arenas. And they weren't prepared for that in terms of lighting. So you can see, you know, the background has gone sh really black. And they are very contrasty because they're using red lights and so forth. So it's really hard to get good shots. You know, the next one would be Led Zeppelin. And that is another arena that's really small. And it was specifically built to... For, that wasn't for the same arena as the Blind It was a Faith. totally different one. This is a 12,000-seat arena for Blind Faith. Led oh, Zeppelin wow. was 2,000. How did you can imagine that? And you needed to use a strobe. And so you can see the shadows in the background. That's how that join the army thing got lit up, because I was using a strobe. And it's the cool thing about that photo is that's, that's in the Zeppelin book that's coming out. The Zeppelin right. book by Led Zeppelin. Yeah. They, the band picked that themselves because of... The join the army, they like the photo, but they actually like the join the army propaganda really in the it. background. Oh, it's totally dates it outside of Jimmy's beard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the next shot is um, is Ike and Tina Turner, and that's at a club, and again a club, a club, maybe two hundred people in the audience, and so again I have to use a strobe, and I've got one of these old mighty lights. You know, it's one hundred and fifty watts, and it's a big news, you know, uh, press photographer, Jimmy Olsen. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, um, and I'm firing away. I'm just going boom, boom, boom. I'm not thinking anything about these performers. And meanwhile, they're just like, their eyes are going well, you're blank. Getting, they're, you're they're, they're seeing spots and everything. <laughs> and they were so consummate, such consummate professionals. I mean, I thought for sure, when I think about those days, that I thought it, for sure I was going to get kicked off, kicked out of the arena. Were you the only one shooting that way? I actually was. You were lucky you didn't get kicked yeah. out. No, but I, they, they knew I was there. And so after the war, and they never said anything about it in those days, you know. They expected people to have strobes because that was the only way to do it. <laughs> it's just funny you think about that compared to today when, you know, everybody's got their little camera that's got all the digital settings inside yeah. of it, you know, their camera, their phone. ISOs you know, of 3200, you don't, you don't need anything. You're out there firing away with a strobe. I mean, you think about that the old strobe thing when they're catching somebody outside of the courtroom, you know, and right. there's a whole bunch of press or, or something, you know, something like that, but not at a concert. Yeah. That's actually pretty cool, though, in the fact you got away with it and got some of the coolest images. I mean, they are unique images because of that alone. Well, they actually started um, amping, um, upping the, the lighting systems for a while, but they were still red or blue or green. And so that affects... That has a huge effect on the quality of the neg that you have because red makes the, everything very contrasty and blue makes things flat. And um, it wasn't until the Stones came into town that things actually changed. Um, they brought their own lighting equipment. So it was no more house lights? No more house lights. Gotcha. And they, they lit up the stage. Yeah. So as far as, as far as a camera exposure goes, you're looking at somebody shooting you know, pushing at a stop could only get 60 at 1.4. So obviously you had pretty much retired the strobe at this point. Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, I was. And because I could get up to 60 at 4, or maybe 60 at 5, 6 at these concerts, when the Stones came in, it was 250 at 8. That's cool. That's cool. And that's at just standard 400 ASA Triax. So the whole industry changed with that because you could get meat on those nags instead of these faint little details that were... Were, uh, were you developing your own film at the time? I did everything. I rolled my own film. I processed my own film, printed everything. I lived in a dark room 
in those I days. I was going to say, that was a lot more work. It was hard work back then. It and was. people weren't firing away 500 images at a show because you had to actually work for it and buy the film. Yeah. You know, I know a few photographers that, you know, look at Robert. He shot Hendrix, and he's got, like, 14 frames because he just didn't have a lot of films. You know, there's a lot of work involved. So you shot... Oh, plus, when you roll in those days, you could roll a couple extra inches on there. So a 36 exposure roll of film that you would buy, I could get 40. Uh-oh. I could get those extra few frames on there so I wouldn't have to change. <laughs> you beat the man. I beat him <laughs> at his own game. But the other thing that was nice is when they did more than one show, the show got over mm -hmm. maybe at 10 or 11, I'd go back to the darkroom, process, pick a shot, find the best shot, print that, 11 by 14 or 16 by 20, show up the next day, and I'd give the artist the print, and then I'd ask him to sign one for me. So I've got this whole stack of... You know, autograph pictures of all these people. You know, from Why from the sixties. Why have seen all this stuff? You keep <laughs> you keep pulling out all this treasure. It's like, oh, yeah. Like Richard, I've known you for I almost eighteen years, and all of a sudden, oh, there's a picture with me in the faces. You didn't show me that. Well, you didn't ask. I didn't know to ask. I got lots of them. I've come over to your house. I don't remember seeing this little <laughs> mystery. They're in a stack. footlocker somewhere. So when you were shooting that way, when you were framing in more on the faces, like you were saying, and like with Elvis and Keith. You described it as a different style of, 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 of photography. What did you say it was again? Yeah, you know, in those days when I started taking pictures, it really was just because it was it was fun and I I wasn't really trying to think of it in terms of a career. So my school of photography more comes down into portraiture. Okay. Because I shot fashion, I shot advertising, product things, and I shot entertainers. And I really think in terms of the camera as a way to get closer, because I'm a fan. Yeah. And so I want to get closer to these people. I want to capture them. I want them to meet me, you know, in the camera. And so you see that in the Elvis pictures or the Keith or Mick Jagger. There's this, there's this tightness there. There's an intimacy and there's there's facial contact. So uh, it's a lot on. different than say a photojournalist. Well, again, there's so that's many another more school. Different angles. Right. Well, that's another school. See, their, their, their agenda is to capture the event. They're ca capturing a moment in history, whereas I'm not concerned with that. I will do yeah. a, a crowd shot or a group shot or something like that, but it's not my main interest. Yeah. I want to get close to the, to the performance. I never knew that there was a real science behind your approach. That's all. And I've been looking at your images for years yeah. until you were talking with Ross Halpin that one time. You got into it. I yeah. was like, oh, okay. That explains a lot of your style. You know? People, I think, are more used to seeing a more photojournalistic view. And, and they like it, and for a good yeah. reason, because it's an event. It's, yeah. And sometimes my pictures are a little, almost too close. They're too intimate. It makes some people uncomfortable. But I, I happen to like great. it. And, you know, when I sell, these people, it's just, I love being close to that close to them. I mean, you look at the Elvis photo that you, that you, you know, that you did when he just looks like he's looking right at you. Yeah, like, and he is. You know, take the picture, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Although that was the Aloha from Hawaii show. Seventy three. Seventy three. You and did both of them. I did. That's pretty cool. That's right, because you have what a hundred and eight images. Yeah, that was a hard uh, show to shoot. Was it? With and, you know, the and there was with all, all the lights, all the lights, but they're shooting for video. They're shooting for video. And so it really doesn't matter. The gamma on video is so wide that you can just drench the stage with light. He's wearing a white suit with all this light. It's reflecting so much. Yeah. But his hair is black and the background is black because they don't want to pick up the audience in the gotcha. background. So you've got black hair against a black background. So you can either expose for the the hair yeah. and get nice curls and things like that, <laughs> but there's nothing to see in the suit. Or you expose to the suit and you hope there's enough glint and grease on his hair that it'll show up. Oh, well, you're hoping work because yeah. those images are fantastic. Wasn't that the first satellite broadcast ever? That was their claim. It was going to be the first satellite. With the colonel's claim. Yeah. Gotcha. And it, it actually, they shot in November and I think they broadcasted it in. Oh, so it in wasn't January. live. It wasn't live. It was shot. Okay. But it was a satellite worldwide broadcast. God, things have changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. So now we're in 1974. Did I'm, you relocate to LA? I did. I did. I met actually at a concert. I met a guy, an A and R guy, with Warner Brothers, 
And we sort of hit it off and became friends. And he said, well, you should come to L.A. And I said, okay. <laughs> so when I, when I graduated from high school. How old were you when you moved to L.A.? 19. So when I graduated from high school, I packed up my gear and moved. That was pretty exciting. Anyway, so I already had an in in the record for Warner Brothers at the time because he worked for Warner Brothers. One of the biggest and, at the time as well. Yeah. And um, he introduced me to Rod's management. And they were in need of a tour booklet. Okay. So I said, well, I, I need to get some shots. I need to, you know, do some shows with you. So they said, sure, come on. So but this is Faces. This is not Rod Stewart. This, this is, is Rod tail- Stewart Faces. Okay, got it. So this is, I'd already shot them in uh, San Bernardino a couple of years earlier with the Not as, as Good as a Wing to a Blind Horse, that, yeah. that show. And so in 74, I started touring with them. When they were near L.A., I would go to all these shows and take pictures of them. So I had absolute total access to them. And you can see in some of the shots, most of the shots, I'm on stage. But I'm very close at these times. You know, there's a yeah. tight shot of Rod, and I'm literally standing over him while he's on the ground with, with his mic, you know, and I'm shooting down over him. And I got a shot of Ron Wood, and he walks right up to me. And I'm, they're, again, they're portraits. Yeah. They're more portraits rather than documenting this, this event. Yeah. And That's so cool. it took 10 shows or so and finally got enough pictures to make a tour booklet, which they sold. So you're sitting there, you're, you've got all this access, and now you're in a limousine, and Rod's reading a record in the back of the limo right, in this photo? Right. So during the days when they're in town, he does, he does a lot of radio interviews and things like that, always promoting something. And so a lot of time I go with him to these different radio stations. and um, Just you and Rod in the limo? In oh, a, a press guy and probably an A&R guy or something like that. But in this case, it's just me and Rod in the waiting in the car for something. And they had just given him a stack of records <laughs> at uh, KLOS. And so he gets back into the car and he's thumbing through it. And they just happen to have given him a Sam Cooke album, which One he's of his like heroes. devouring there. And it's, uh, it's him reading. It's him reading this shot. And um, I think at those days, I think people were aware that Rod was channeling Sam Cooke yeah. when he sang. So this is just kind of makes that tie-in. So he's just looking at the liner notes, yep. taking it all in. Well, he's listening also to uh, something on the radio. Okay. I don't know, know if it's actually a... don't remember then. So you're shooting Rory Gallagher. Yeah, he was the warm-up act. He was the warm-up act for Rod in the 75 tour, I think it was. Right after the faces broke up? No. So it was the During, last of the faces. It was the last of the faces before he oh, does okay. Atlantic before, Crossing. Before Woody joins the Stones, gotcha. I mean, I was a big Rory Gallagher fan anyway. A lot of people so. are. What are you doing at the Hyatt with him on Sunset? As I recall, I was picking him up to go to Disneyland. <laughs> As one does. <laughs> yeah, so, everybody's got that Rory Gallagher Disneyland story. Yeah. You're just one of many. Well, right? actually, because he cut his thumb <laughs> and he was playing, and so he didn't want to go. So it's just me and Donald. And so that's with the bandage and all on the guitar. That's the, and all that. the bandage on his got thumb. It. So Donald and another guy and a girl. We all piled into a car and just went to Disneyland and had a hoot nanny. Well, it's the happiest place on earth. Why well, wouldn't you? It was fun. So we you had to cheer out. him up for his broken thumb. No, I think he had <laughs> something there to cheer him up okay. while we were gone. It was the seventies. Yeah. So he did other shows, and you could see this shot that. Um, that I, that's up on the screen now, is that it's very dark. So he was actually w- doing the, the warm-up act for Rod Stewart, Yeah. but then he had his own agenda. So when Rod wasn't playing, Rory was out doing Santa Barbara, doing Costa Mesa. What size places? Yeah, these are like old movie theaters that are converted oh, into... okay. Playing. So there are maybe 800 people. So he was doing good business yeah. back then. That's and cool. the shot that, uh, where he's caught in the air, yeah. that was in Santa Barbara. Gotcha. At the bowl? No, yeah, at a, a theater. At a theater. The other shots there were actually, uh, we walked from the Hyatt House up to Chateau Marmont. Okay. And we shot outside. And then it starts to rain. And we're driving in my Carmen Gear, which is a convertible. <laughs> so I pull out an umbrella and I take my coat off because he's cold. He's from Ireland. How could he be cold? I'm cold. <laughs> so he's got my pea coat on and he's holding my umbrella. And these are some just lovely portraits of... 
Rory in the rain. Great candidates. Yeah. Nobody has any of that. The nicest person. Unbelievable. Everybody says that. He was. So that week, you, you, Roy says you just ended up not wanting to go down there. So you made the best of it with everybody else. But you said you had other deals with Roy that week, shooting records or shooting shooting. Yeah, we, uh, there was a tattoo parlor across the street from the Hyatt House. We, we went over Sunset there. Sunset Strip Tattoo. Yeah. No, it was called, was it? Well, it was when across I moved the street? here in, in 90. Oh, maybe it was. Okay, right yeah. Right across from the Riot House. Yes. And uh, that's where the uh, tattoo album cover. Oh, okay. So that was yours as well. Yeah. Very cool. So you, you liked taking these people out, so you decided in 1978 that you would take Van Halen to McDonald's. Yeah, well, they couldn't afford anything more than... You got McDonald's. you got to go on the whole whole everything because there's a so, lot of mystery surrounding the yeah. arches with, with Van Halen. <laughs> that, yeah. Okay. So, in '78, I get a call to uh, go with Van Halen or Eddie and David on a radio tour. So right before the right, record came out. Right after the right record. Right after. Okay. Came out. So we're basically hitting the Midwest and the East Coast. So it's winter. 78, songs out, we're hitting these radio stations, they're doing their interviews and so forth. And of course, we're also hitting the distribution centers for Warner Electra. Yeah. And, you know, they're, everybody's just loved these guys, they're so much fun. And, and so we're taking a break in the limousine, and we go to this McDonald's. And like most people do, again, yeah, McDonald's in well, the limo. That's you can see the jackets they're wearing, they're both wearing the yeah. same jackets. They didn't have enough money to get nice coats. So they went to an army surplus store and bought these two army fur line jackets. So they're both green. what that was all yeah. about. No, they were both. Uh, and it was well, cold. from Pasadena. They don't know what weather it's going to be like That's in right. Detroit. Or this Somebody told Detroit. them it was cold. Well, okay. So we're in Detroit and we go to this place and I'm thinking we stopped at a McDonald's near there and then we went on. So yeah. I take this picture of them standing in front of this, one of the early McDonald's with a single arch. Yeah. And um, and that becomes just this... Uh, impromptu photo shoot. Impromptu photo shoot, but it becomes this photograph of these two guys just goofing around, and it becomes hugely popular. And there's been discussions I've picked up on the, on the Internet trying to find out where this, where this McDonald's is, because nobody can find it. And I say, <laughs> with the shot, that it's shot in Detroit. Actually, it's not Detroit. Well, that's how we had it listed on Rock and Roll Gallery all those years. That's right. Detroit. I just figured you were one of the local radio stations there. That's what I want people to think, because it's, it's a suburb of Detroit. Got I it. Say. It's a place called Windsor. It's actually in okay. Canada. We're in a foreign country now. Okay. Anyway, I get these uh, emails from people that say, you know, that's not in Windsor. <laughs> I have a friend in St. Louis who says it's actually in St. Louis. And I'm thinking, oh, come on, people. And uh, so I decide to go through this. I'm going to find this thing in Windsor. I'm going to send them, look at this <laughs> location. And I hit every McDonald's in Windsor. And then I go through Detroit. And I'm thinking, it's not there. What, do aerial Google or something? Yeah, exactly. Using Google. Gosh. Come down, get street level. I can look at it. It's not there. The things you do for people that don't have lives... Well, it was actually fun because I did. I decided yeah. to go to St. Louis, and I went to this suburb that they said it's in Crestwood, and sure enough, there that's it, it. It's in Crestwood, which is a suburb of St. Louis. God, mystery solved, yeah. Colombo. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now we're you, you're you're in Santa Monica with Blondie. Oh yes. Well, Deborah Harry, but it's so, on the beach. There's a request from Chrysalis Records to do a rock video. On Blondie. Okay. okay. So they asked me to produce this thing. So they're doing shows at the Starwood and at the Whiskey. What year? 77. Oh, so wow. it's actually so early, before, early. Okay. before Van Halen. So, um, so I can put my crew together. And because uh, by that time, I'm actually working more in film movies yeah. than I am in s shooting rock and roll. So we set up to shoot whiskey, a couple, two or three shows at the whiskey, a couple of shows at the Starwood, and then taking the song references, one of them is In the Sun. And so they're going to play over, she's going to lip sync to the song while she's frolicking on the beach. And so there's this whole scene in this uh, video of them where she's running through the water at the pier in Santa Monica. And so while we're in between takes, 
there's this shot of her with the glasses on, with her yeah. new, new new way of glasses on, and I'm saying, oh, we're talking about her movements in that, and so she's going, yeah, I can do this and do this and do this, you know, and then she strikes this pose, and then, boom, she's so. No, that's a money shot. She's it's beautiful, so un, in that. but it's so unblondy. Yeah, you just think of her as a bit more dark, edgy, you know, like you said, at the whiskey, Starwood, CBGBs. Yes, you right. know, to the, just the curves in her body of, uh, it's just so nice in that shot. Yeah, no, she was definitely showing it off there. That's mm -hmm. good. You well, after a few years after that, I had friends who were uh, in a band called the Surf Punks. Okay. And they'd actually had a few albums out before I, I got involved with them, but I got the call to come and shoot them for their next album, which was Locals Only. It was a great, great afternoon. However, you know, I, I really can't take credit for this. The shot came out just right. It's a great color shot. They, unfortunately, used it in black and white for the album. But Dennis... The surf punk punk. Yeah. He created this whole scene. You know, he had it so all. So he dressed the set. He dressed the okay. set. I showed up with my Hasselblad and, okay. you know, spent an hour, took the pictures and went. He set that whole thing up. And that picture's now been pretty much immortalized in that Tashin and book. And it's in the Tashin surf book, yeah. Yeah, the big coffee table book. And pretty much after that, it sort of wound down on the music thing for you, didn't it? It did. It did. Um, things changed a lot, didn't they? Well, yes, they did. Um, but I was moving away from that already. Okay. Well, because I was more interested in movies, yeah, yeah, with movies and so forth. And I got really interested in uh, the technical side of photography. So at that point, I went back to school and I got a a master's degree in optical engineering. Well, it's been a great having you it's on here. It's been fun. And we'll have to do it again and bring out okay. some other images that you've taken got that it. were unmusic related.